They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. So this is one of the most amazing moments and displays of courage and conviction and just being radical that you ever see in the book of Acts. And this is the type of, of faith and mentality that we're trying to restore in the 21st century. Uh, a radical group of disciples that even if one of you got, got flogged, even if you got stoned, uh, that you would just get right back up and march right back into the city and keep preaching God's word. Amen? So we've had a, a radicalization series. And today, you're not going to just hear one charge. You're going to hear four charges. Oh, 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 radical. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who's going to preach to us about go. radical invitation. Jesus in Luke 6 and verse 40, it says the student 
comes down above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher.
Christian, when it comes to building God's church, yep, yep. this is not the style by which we can live by. Yeah. See, reinventing the wheel is not something that we need to subscribe to. Right. We are here fighting to restore the original blueprint of the building of the primitive Christian church. Reinventation is the only way that that will be possible. So you may be asking, okay, so what's the point here? I think what we need to understand is that learning and imitating the style of Jesus' ministry is not a style, it's the standard. Beyond 500, Preach. other than the Demetrius. Wow. And 
of our leaders. And if we can step up and become like that, can you imagine the multiplication? And you may have felt a little hurt by that, but here's the thing. I'm not sorry you're hurt. I hope that we repent. Churches. 
it's quite interesting to say because we know from Acts chapter 2, that's not how it started. That it was the same as what the apostles taught, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayer. That was the standard. And now, several decades later, perhaps, Paul is now pleading with this church in Corinth to get back to this place. But how did he get there? Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1 down to verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Amen? Amen. The Bible teaches us right here that the very problem which had started to happen was a beginning to follow personalities. And one of Paul, and another Apollos, and another yeah. Peter, and then got the hyper spiritual was, I follow Christ! Yeah. 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 My prayer, my appeal is that you'll be perfectly united in my mind, that there are no divisions. There is identity, right. but there is no division. Come on. Transitions and changes, if we're not careful, there can become division. Oh, well, I, I, I follow Apollos. I follow this leader. I follow, I'm a part of this group or, or this Bible talk or this super region. And there must be identity. But be careful not to cause division. As we have transitions in our teams, Right now, I'm here to let you know there are no more mission teams. Right. There's no like, hey, I'm part of the, the Orange County mission team. No, you're part of the Orange County region. Yeah. 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 I'm part of the North Valley mission team. No, you're not. You're part of the North Valley super region. Yeah. 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 Because of miscommunication. Nice, but nice. The Revolutionary War. 
because of this communication. Why? They simply did not speak the same language. Three keys to learn the language of your leader. A lot of times when we come in, you go, you know, this leader needs to learn me. What? What? Do for what you want right now. Oh. 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 Oh
John 17, verse 20. My, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that you will be believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Forged or forgery? It says right here that, that we've got to be brought to complete. Unity is not something that you find. It's something that you forge. And a lot of us have got to understand you never graduate from here. Yeah. Although it's not about unity diversity. We see it as disciples, as learners, as students to the very end. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron. It's forged. First Peter 1, 6 through 7, it's, just, it's like pure gold that's refined by fire. Very quick, four facets to forge unity. Number one is, is fire. We gotta heat things up. I think a lot of we gotta turn up the temperature in our talks with one another. Yeah. A lot of times, it's, just, it's, just, it's uncomfortable. You ever put your hand by it, right? You just don't want to get too close because it's uncomfortable. Yeah. We've got to be willing to have the uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. just don't want to talk to. Oh, those conversations you just don't want to have. Oh, Write down all those and don't work from the ones that you want to have. Oh, go from the ones that you don't want to have. So that you can have a forced unity rather than a forgery of unity. Oh. Secondly, it's family. Fast family. As I said there, First Corinthians, you don't know how many fathers I think for a lot of us, as we have these transitions, you've got to be willing to make the man of God as that spiritual father or mother yeah. in the faith. Yeah. It doesn't mean that uh, you don't have other ones from before, but if you're not willing to become a son, if you're not willing to become a daughter in any of these relationships, then yes, you protect yourself from being quote unquote torn down, but you also stop yourself from being able to be built up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The opposite of not being radically renewed is losing heart. You're losing your passion. And the word lose heart in the Greek is actually one word that literally means to be utterly spiritless, wearied out, or exhausted. And so we talk about being radical in our courage, doing great deeds of faith. But it really takes a whole other level of radicalness to be radically vulnerable before God. And to pour your heart out to him so that you can be renewed. And I believe with all my heart, if you listen to what the word of God says today, you'll walk out of this room totally changed and transformed. And the things I'm going to share with you are what have kept me faithful for 25 years. Okay. You have three infections. 
I do. Uh, I'm not perfect in it all the time, but but I really want to encourage you. That's where you kind of like you put your phone in the wall, get charged, charge it up. Yeah. That's where God can sanctify. Yep. Oh, 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 and you know, the sin of prayerlessness is what kills so many people. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, wow, I, I, 
I've got to devote myself to this. What does it say in Acts 2? That they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching oh, yeah. after they heard the gospel. Oh, yeah. And that loyalty mm -hmm. and devotion then created bravery. You took a stance for what you learned. Right. You took a stance against your parents. You took a stance against, you know, your job, your, your classmates, your co-workers. You took a stance, and that stance came at the cost of a self-sacrificing devotion to God. Right. And then when you did it, you actually said, you know what, I'm just going to give up my job. I'm going to give up this relationship. Yeah. I'm going to give up, you know, being that closeness to my family. I'm going to create that division. Yeah. What did that do? It helped you understand the power of God's love in your life. Yeah. So they really do work this way. So in a way, a radical sacrifice is the greatest sign possibly, or one of the greatest signs, of your loyalty and devotion to God. And that's why we see it all throughout the Bible. That those are the greatest moments that a prophet or a man or a woman showed that they really felt God's love in their life and they were going to be so devoted, so loyal to him, that Abraham would be willing to kill his son. That Ezra's going to come out and Nehemiah would be willing to go back. That Jonathan would be willing to not be the king to be and let David take that place. Radical sacrifice is one of the greatest moments of Christianity. Oh, Turn with me over to Philippians chapter 3. From Philippians chapter 3, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. Paul says, And whatever was to my prophet, I now consider a loss for the sake of of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, mm -hmm. for whom sake I have lost all things. Wow. I consider them rubbish. Yep. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death and so somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Oh, you know, Paul, come on, Jesus. Who in the eyes of the world in the first century would have been in the top 1%. Yeah. He was a Pharisee. Guy was like a, he had a governmental status, he had a spiritual status, he would have been the elite of his society. Yeah. He says, Hey, I consider all that I lost, right. all that I gave up, I consider it rubbish. Oh, he goes, and I lost all things. Wow. You know, some believe that the, the thorn in his flesh was the loss of his wife or something yeah. like that, and, and that he may have been married because he became a disciple, that he even lost her. Tortured for you. Yeah. 
and killed as a at, right after that. Yep. You know, we are here because of radical sacrifice. Yes. And why does God give us missions? He wants us to be able to partake in some of that radical oh, come on. He wants to give you an opportunity that you can say, like Paul, I, I've been able to share a little bit in the sufferings of Christ. Come on, bro. There you go. In the radical sacrifice of Christ. Yeah. One of the two radical sacrifices I want to talk about very quickly. Come on. And number one is a radical sacrificing of one's will. Wow. Let's look over here at James chapter 4. Come on. Come on, Jason. Come on, Jason. Come on, Jason. In James chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Come on. Today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and you brag, all such boast is evil. Anyone then who knows the good you ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Wow. The radical sacrificing of one's will. You know, there is a, a chasm for disciples to cross and sometimes recross again and again. Yeah. And that is submitting your emotions yeah. and your desires Woo! to convictions of the Bible. Yeah, Lord right. have mercy. We talked about a little bit like today with the soul and spirit. And yeah. learning how to separate your emotions from principles. Yeah. Yeah. And when we come to the kingdom and we've been trained by society to be so in our flesh, so animalistic. Yeah. And, and sometimes we come in the kingdom and we can try and spiritualize <laughs> being led by your emotions and your desires and act like you're kind of a, a, a agnostic in a way. And then you have some higher functioning that you think that this is God's will for you in your life. Oh to do this or that. But it's not really what the people around you think or even what the Bible would teach you. Wow. We've got to learn how to separate ourselves from what we want to do. And to surrender ourselves to what God would call us to do. And I can say this because I'm somebody that's so geared like this. That when I came to the kingdom, I had a lot of emotions that was led by them. And could then take those emotions and try and spiritualize those. Man, I, I just feel like God's working in my heart on this one. You know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful beyond pure. Who can understand it? This is why God gave us the Bible so that you would not be led by your heart. And you want to spiritualize it and say it's God working in my heart. How do you know it's not Satan working in your life? Whoa! in the church. Yeah. And we actually submit to it. This is one of the main yeah. reasons why we are persecuted in the yeah. world. Right. Because we actually have one over another relationships, oh. rabbi-teacher relationships, and we submit to those, and we allow them to be a guiding light to the scriptures yeah. in our lives. Oh. And, and there is a signing up in a spiritual or radical spirituality to surrender and sacrifice our will to these things. Yeah. Does this mean that somebody who's a leader could call you to do something sinful? Not at all. Yeah. But if somebody's in your life and people in your life that are calling you to biblical things, but you think your, your higher functioning idea of what God maybe is working in your heart yeah. is doing, man, you're going to eventually leave God. Right. Yeah. Fundamentally, don't want to practice discipleship. And you define yourself like this here in James 4, where you're saying, hey, I, I'm going to do this or that, I'm going to do these different things. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, I'll do yes. this. And I'm going to surrender that in a radical way in my discipleship. Oh, bro. You know, the people who get this grow incredibly. Yeah. You know, they get, and I, I was seen amongst many incredible heroes of that here. People who in a very scary way submitted themselves 
and practice radical discipleship. And we see those people become powerful. And if you find yourself you not know, the same guy I was a year ago or two years ago, it's because you don't have a, a radical sacrifice of your will to allow yourself to be trained and discipled in the ministry. And instead, you're trying, kind of parting your own course and doing it your own way. Revival. 
Bible is called Radical Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be radical. Let's blow out our missions this Sunday. Yeah. And let's watch God do in the next so we can ask for it. Amen. the 
bottom, your, your body is the physical tent that we live in, yep. and how the word just divides our emotional and our spiritual. It was very, I, I love that, very insightful. But more importantly, I love the challenge that he gave. Because prayer is where you can truly get sanctified. Yeah. Yeah. Prayer is where you truly get renewed. Yeah. During the AMS, we have a prayer challenge where every day we're praying for an hour a day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So as we're getting out there every single morning, I'm feeling renewed. I'm ready to be a better disciple. I'm ready to be a better husband. I'm ready to go and finish my traditions. I'm ready to do what needs to be done. Oh, it's a big yeah. renewal through prayer. Lord. And then lastly, of course, make some noise for Jason Dimitri. I love how he especially talked about just the resources. Radical resources. No one claimed that anything was their own. They sold property and possessions, and they put it at the apostles' feet. You know, I think one of the reasons, it was so great, I just celebrated 13 years as a disciple. Come on!